here's the wood I have to make the top. It's some really nice eight quarter cherry. But like other hardwoods, the flat sawn face of these boards has some wide cathedral type grain that I find is difficult to match for a nice consistent looking top. So I'm going to take advantage of the edge of the board, which is a tighter grain. And since I have these nice thick boards, I'll be ripping off an inch and three sixteenths off each one, turning those boards sideways, and then gluing them back together to form the top. Using this method, I have some unique opportunities to book match neighboring boards. So as I cut these, I'll number each one, not only to help with the grain match, but to be able to have some choices about how to display that grain on the face of the table. Even in the rough sawn state, I can start to see how this grain match is going to be very interesting on the top of the table and look great. So I've laid out all the boards, which gives me an opportunity to address any defects that I don't want showing on the top of the table. So on this particular board, I can choose to put that knot face down. It's still in the same order that we cut them but there's two sides to each board. So I can pick the best color and grain match amongst all the boards. When I find the grain match that I'm looking for, I'll mark the top with a big triangle. And I'm going to glue this up in three sections, six boards a piece. That way I'll be able to flatten the individual sections using the planer and the wide drum sander and then glue all three together. With the three pieces for the tabletop planed and jointed, it's time to glue them up. And it goes pretty much just like the other joints. Just a thin layer of glue, even clamping pressure throughout. But this time, I need to make sure that I keep the top of the table level all the way across. Because there's no running this big tabletop through my planer. It's too big. It may look like I'm freehanding a board running it through the table saw, but I actually have a runner attached to the bottom of the tabletop that fits in the miter slot. It's a great way to square up a large board. To cut the other end of the table, all I have to do is remove this runner and tack it in place on this side and repeat the procedure. The next step in preparing the top to receive the breadboard ends is to form a tongue along the edge. And I'll start that process here at the table saw by taking a shallow cut on either side of the board. I'll remove the rest of the table doing multiple passes with a spiral upcut bit on the router table.
I'll clean up these router marks left by the multiple passes and bring this tongue to a uniform thickness using the block plane. So I've purposely left the top a little bit wide in case I had any tear out while forming the tongue on the end of the tabletop. And now it's time to cut it to size. It's going to be 30 inches finish width. Since this is going to be a blind breadboard end, we need to cut this tenon back a little bit so that when we cap it with the breadboard end you won't see this part of the board. This tabletop is a little big for me to stand up in my joiner, so I'm going to get a nice smooth edge on there using a flush trim bit and a guide clamped underneath. With the long tenon shaped on the end of the tabletop, it's time to make the mortise in the breadboard ends. The first step, I plane this to a thickness just a hair greater than the tabletop thickness itself. And that'll give me a little room to tweak it after I've got the mortise in this. So it's off to the table saw to cut these to width, and then we'll form that long mortise that matches that long tenon and caps the end of the tables. Using the crosscut sled, I'm going to cut the breadboard ends to their final length. It's slightly bigger than the exact width of the tabletop, which is 30 inches. I'm allowing an inch more on either end to put a big chamfer on the end of the breadboard ends. So I'll make a square cut and then cut both pieces to length. The first step in making that long mortise in the breadboard ends is to drill a pilot hole at each end that matches the diameter of the router bit I'm going to use to create that long mortise. In this case, it's 3 eighths of an inch. After drilling the pilot holes, I've installed a 3 eighths inch spiral upcut bit in the router table, and I can use the pilot hole as a starting point and I'll make the mortise in multiple passes and I've also drawn a pencil line on the end so I know where to stop. So I'm going to start in this position, move down here, and when the end of the board reaches that pencil mark, I'll stop. After a few passes, I reach the final depth that matches the width of that tenon, and this breadboard end will slide right on the end. That's a nice fit. We have a little bit of sanding to do to equalize these two surfaces, but overall that looks nice. Next, I'm going to move on to chamfering these ends at the router table.
The breadboard ends will slip over that tongue that we've created in the tabletop and get fastened by three screws and elongated holes on the outside edge. So I've drilled a 5 8 inch hole approximately a half inch deep that I need to square up now because after we secure this with screws into the tabletop there's going to be a decorative plug square pyramid shaped plug that goes in and conceals the screw. Using a handheld drill, I'll drill through the square hole and down into that mortise area and that's where the screws will go. I'm going to drill an elongated hole by moving the drill back and forth. With the breadboard end in place, I can drill some pilot holes into that tenon through the holes that we just made in the breadboard end. When installing the breadboard end, there's only one place that gets glue. About three or four inches along the center is the only place that we're going to glue. This glue and the screws will hold this breadboard end on, but since we have elongated holes, it will allow this top to expand and contract within this mortise. Now I can install the screws. There's a couple of washers on the end just to draw everything in tight and the fact that we made an elongated hole we need to compensate for that. To make the plugs to conceal the screw holes, I've dimensioned some stock square, and I put a piece of tape around here as a reference line. And every time I rotate the stock, I'll line up the edge of the tape with that little mark on my sled. Next, I'll taper the sides of the plug so that it inserts in easily and wedges in place. After tapering and tailoring this plug to fit this hole, it's just a matter of gluing it in and then tapping it into place. With the installation of the breadboard ends complete, now I'll sand the entire top. I'm going to start with 80 grit and work my way all the way up through 220. Well that does it for this part of the video, but I invite you to check out the all new Eagle Lake Woodworking. 
to see the rest of the videos in this series and videos on other woodworking topics. You can access all parts of the videos in one easy viewer. Check out the photo galleries, in process work, measured drawings, and finished projects. You can also download files associated with projects. So check it out at www.eaglelakewoodworking.com.